hypothyroidism thanks all for uh, uh, appreciating all the previous talks i'm dr pradeep joshi i am a consulting physician in bhavnagar gujarat and uh, i am uploading these talks uh, for the medical students uh, studying in mbbs as well as in md medicine so today we will talk about the thyrotoxicosis now uh, first uh, let's uh, talk about some basics if we see the thyroid physiology then very important is the iodine metabolism the average daily iodine requirement is 0.1 mg the main sources are fish milk eggs or as additive in bread and salt because most of the time now in india we are using the iodized salt it was a community trial to reduce the epidemic goiters so most of the salt in india is containing good amount of iodine and it helps also because uh, iodized salt given to the pregnant lady the lack of the iodine is also thought to be uh, a cause of uh, less iq uh, in the children so giving iodized salt also increases the intelligence and iq in the children so that we are seeing uh, now right now because that generation of iodized salt taking uh, uh, mothers children are now grown up and are in medical colleges now in the stomach and jejunum iodine is rapidly converted to the iodide and absorbed into the blood stream so iodine is now ionized and it is it becomes iodide and it gets absorbed iodide is actively transported into the thyroid follicular cell by a atp dependent process the thyroid is the storage site of more than 90% of the body's iodine content so this is a storage site of body's iodine more than 90% of the body's iodine is in the thyroid gland now iodine trapping involves the active atp dependent transport of iodine across the basement membrane of the thyroid via intrinsic membrane protein the sodium iodine symporter the oxidation of iodine to iodine sorry to iodide to iodine and iodination of tyrosine happens inside the thyroid gland and thyroglobulin so iodide again becomes iodine and this iodine is now incorporated into the tyrosine in the thyroglobulin to form the monoiodotyrosine and diiodotyrosine and now the arithmetic uh, equations come into the play mit plus dit makes tetraiodothyronine sorry triiodothyronine and 2 di becomes the tetraiodothyronine so mit plus dit is t3 and dit plus dit is t4 so coupling of two dit is t4 and one dit and one mit is t3 the thyroglobulin is hydrolyzed to release the free iodotyronines t3 and t4 and mono and diiodotyronines by stimulation of tsh engulfing within the thyroid follicle now whenever the pituitary sends a signal in the form of the tsh to release the t3 and t4 the thyroglobulin gets hydrolyzed and t3 and t4 are released in iodized form the latter are deiodinated in the fifth step to yield the iodine which is then recirculated there is a just like antrohepatic circulation there is a antrothyroid circulation of the iodine so whatever iodine gets released from this iodized t3 and t4 if, when they enters inside the blood they are free t3 and free t4 not iodinated so whatever iodine gets released from them again is utilized inside the thyroid gland so this is the typical thyroid follicles as well as the thyroid gland and the uh, epithelium lining the follicles so in short the blood is whenever the, the sodium uh, the sodium iodine symporter the iodine enters inside the cell thyroglobulin is secreted when the tsh stimulates the thyroid gland this uh, monoiodotyrosine di tetra and triiodothyrosine synthesis happens here exocytosis happens the iodine is again released the t3 and t4 enters inside the blood stream while the iodine is again reutilized in the euthyroid state the t4 is produced and released entirely by the thyroid gland whereas and only 20% of the total t3 is produced by the thyroid gland so whatever t4 is there in the blood it comes from the thyroid but whatever the t3 comes only 20% is from the thyroid gland the rest gets converted from the t4 so most of the t3 produced by the peripheral deiodination the removal of 5 iodine from the outer ring of t4 happens in liver muscles kidney and anterior pituitary a reaction that is catalyzed by 5 mono deiodinase 
So only 20% T3 comes from the thyroid, rest 80% comes from the deiodination of the T4, which happens inside the liver, muscle, kidneys, and anterior pituitary. The thyroid hormones are transported in the serum bound to carrier proteins such as T4 binding globulin, T4 binding albumin, and T4 binding prealbumin. So all these proteins we call the bound pro uh, hormones. It is not a free hormone, it is we call it a total T4. So Whichever conditions increases the globulin or increases the albumin or prealbumin, this will alter the total T4 but not the free T4. That is very important when we will talk about the diagnostic criteria as well as the taste of the hyperthyroidism. So this is the tyrosine when and it gets converted into tetraiodotyrosine that is T4, triiodothyronine that is T3 and some uh, reversal the process also happens that's called reverse t3 this is inactive there is a condition where there is too much of reverse t3 production so though there is hyper functioning the patient can have some features of the hypothyroidism so a tyrosine t4 triiodothyronine t3 and reverse t3 two iodines on the upper side one iodine on the lower side is called the reverse T3, which is inactive, which is not physiologically active. Only a small fraction, that is 0.02% of the thyroid hormone T3 and T4 is free, unbound, and is physiologically active. Now, this is very important. Very, very less, 0.02% are FT3 and FT4. Rest is bound, and they are the bound are not physiologically active. Only the free or unbound is physiologically active. T3 is more potent of the two thyroid hormones, although its circulating plasma level is much lower than of the T3, T4, sorry. So T3 is the main active hormone. T4 is not the main active hormone. T3 is three to four times more potent and active than T4 per unit weight with a half-life of about one day, while the half-life is of T4 is around seven days. So T4 is not much active physiologically. It is acting as a reservoir which gets converted into t3 which is the main active hormone and that is having a short half life of one day t4 is having a longer half life of seven days so how the uh, this axis the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis works the thyrotrophin releasing hormone the trh gets secreted from the hypothalamus whenever there is a need it stimulates the pituitary and pituitary to make the tsh this stimulates the thyroid gland to produce the t3 and t4 T3 gives negative feedback to the pituitary to stop the production of the TSH. At the same time, the T4 and the iodine are also made. This T4, which enters inside the circulation, goes to the tissue where the uh, in the liver, as well as in the anterior pituitary, in the muscles, the T4 gets converted into the T3 and iodine is released. This T3 again gives negative feedback to the pituitary to reduce or stop the secretion of the TSH. The T4 goes to the pituitary where the deiodination takes place, the T3 is formed, and this T3, in, uh, after uh, this uh, T3 gives the real, uh, negative feedback to the hypothalamus to stop or reduce the secretion of thyrotrophin releasing hormone. So remember, it is always the T3 which gives the negative feedback, whether it is a T3 coming from the thyroid, whether it is T3 coming from the tissue, from the deiodination of the T4, or whether it is the T3 coming from the T4 entering to the thyroid and getting itself deiodinated. So T3 gives the negative feedback to reduce the TRH and TSS so that the production of T4, T3 and T4 is reduced from the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is also capable of autoregulation, which allows it to modify its function independent of the TSH. Thyroid gland is not totally dependent on the pituitary, but it has also got the autoregulation. As an adaptation to low iodine intake, the gland preferentially synthesizes T3 rather than T4. This is something called a protective mechanism. Whenever there is a low iodine intake, whenever a person is uh, living in an uh, area where there is a low iodine in the water or in the food, the gland produces more T3 than T4 because the T3 is more active. In situation of iodine access, the iodine, iodide transport, peroxide generation and synthesis and secretion of thyroid hormone is inhibited. This is something called iodine constipation of the thyroid gland. When there is too much of the iodine, this iodine stops the transport of iodine inside the peroxide generation as well as the synthesis and secretion of the thyroid hormones. 
Excessively large doses of iodine may lead to initial increased organification followed by suppression of a phenomena. This is called wolf Tchaikov effect. So whenever a patient is given a very large dose of iodine, it may initially increase the organification, but it will be followed by a suppression. This is called wolf Tchaikov effect. The what I told you, this is the iodine constipation of the thyroid gland. If you give too much amount of the large iodine, then the hormone synthesis by thyroid gland will gradually reduce, and the patient might land up into a hypothyroidism. This is called wolf. Tchaikov effect. There is another phenomena called George Besdo phenomena. We will see it later on. But at this stage, you just remember that wall Tchaikov is the thyroid constipation because of the iodine. Now we all know how the thyroid function, thyroid hormone functions. In humans, the two types of T3 receptor genes, that is alpha and beta, are located on the chromosome 3 and 17. Alpha form is abundant in the central nervous system, whereas the beta is predominantly there in the liver. The thyroid hormones affect almost every system of the body. They are important for fetal brain development and skeletal maturation. T3 increases the oxygen consumption, basal metabolic rate and heart production by stimulation of sodium potassium ATPase in various tissues. So this is something like a petrol. Without the petrol, the engine doesn't work. Same way, the th without the thyroid hormones, most of the systems in the body will not work. It is very important for the fetal brain development and then, when, therefore, whenever there is lack of thyroid hormones in the fetus what there is a condition what we call the cretinism it is also has a positive inotropic and chronotropic effect on the heart and it potentiates the action of the catecholamines so without the thyroid hormones the catecholamines will not be that much, that much powerful to increase the uh, positive inotropic and chronotropic action on the heart Inotropic is the force of contraction, chronotropic is heart rate. They also increase the GI motility and that is the reason that hyperthyroidism leads to diarrhea Well, the hypothyroidism leads to constipation. Thyroid hormones also increase the bone and protein turnover and the speed of muscle contraction and relaxation. So what are the tests we do? We do the uh, TSH level, we do the total T3, we do the total T4 as well as we do the free T3 and free T4. The normal reference range is mentioned here. And in some cases, we do the thyroid antibodies. The thyroid antibodies like thyroid ant antibody to the thyroglobulin, antimicrosomal antibody, antithyroperoxidase antibody, anti-TP antibody, and thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, TSI, which is very important. We will see it later on in the Graves disease. So in hyperthyroidism or in Graves disease, there will be increase in the free T4 and decrease in the TSH. The main hormones we will measure is free T4 and TSH. There is not much role of total 3, 3, T4 or free T3. So only two hormones to be measured are free T4 and TSH whenever we are diagnosing the hyperthyroidism or when we are monitoring a case of hyperthyroidism who is already on medical treatment. Now the two terms, the thyrotoxicosis and hyperthyroidism are different. These are not synonyms. What is thyrotoxicosis? Thyrotoxicosis is biochemical and physiological manifestation of excessive thyroid hormone. So I just uh, explained to the students that thyrotoxicosis is first MEBS, hyperthyroidism is second and final MEBS. So thyrotoxicosis is physiological and biochemical manifestation. These two uh, subjects you learn in the first MBBS. Biochemical and physiological manifestation of excessive thyroid hormones. Thyrotoxicosis need to be due to hyperthyroidism. That means thyrotoxicosis can be due to hyperthyroidism, but each and every case of hyperthyroidism is not a thyrotoxicosis. Let's make it simple. Thyrotoxicosis means increase in the thyroid hormone from whichever the source. This can be from thyroid, this can be from other source. Suppose a patient has taken too much high doses of uh, the uh, uh, hypothyroid uh, hormone supplement. That also causes thyrotoxicosis. Some ectopic site is producing the thyroid hormone. That also causes the thyrotoxicosis. So whenever the reason is outside the thyroid gland, we call it a thyrotoxicosis. But when the reason is in the thyroid gland, we call it a hyper thyroidism and this reason should be long standing or permanent i will uh, clear it in the next slide the hyperthyroidism it is a term reserved for a disorder that resulted over production of the hormone by the gland that should be long standing or prolonged or permanent in short 
hyperthyroidism is the pathology is in the thyroid gland. So whenever the pathology is in the thyroid gland, we call it hyperthyroidism. When the features are there, but the cause is uh, elsewhere, we call it thyrotoxicosis. So this will make it more clear. Hyperthyroidism, Graves disease, toxic nodular goiter, toxic adenoma, or jod based dose disease. jod based dose disease is whenever a patient is living in an area where there is normal iodine supply in the food or water, whenever these patients are given large dose of thyroid, or whenever suppose this patient has a nodule which is uh, hyperactive, if this patient is giving large dose of thyroid, uh, sorry, iodine, this patient will land up into a uh, hyperthyroidism. What we call iodine induced thyroid diarrhea. In the Wolff-Chaikoff effect, we saw that it is the thyroid constipation. Wolff-Chaikoff was thyroid constipation because of the iodine, while George Bezdo is the thyroid diarrhea because of the iodine. Whenever there is a nodule, hyperactive nodule, but it is functioning normally, whenever you give high dose of iodine, it starts producing more hormones and patient lands up into hyperthyroidism. So whenever there is a diffuse Graves disease or a single nodular goiter or multinodular goiter producing too much of the hormones, toxic adenoma or a iodine uh, increasing the function of the whole of the thyroid gland, these are all the hyperthyroidism. What is toxicosis without hyperthyroidism? Thyrotoxicosis facticia. Suppose uh, in some gymnasium, some instructor is giving a thyroid hormone supplement to induce the weight loss. This can be a thyrotoxicosis facticia. Or the patient is taking thyroid hormone to reduce the weight. Subacute thyroiditis, this is as I told you, this is a transient phenomena, not a long standing or permanent. Ectopic functioning thyroid, the thyroid hormones are producing, produced by some ectopic uh, tissue. Silent thyroiditis, stroma ovari, metastatic follicular carcinoma trophoblastic tumors or postpartum thyroiditis. Whenever the thyroid is produced from ectopic foci or it is produced from the thyroid gland, but it is transient, we call it toxicosis without hyperthyroidism. This is very important because sometimes a postpartum thyroiditis, if you do the FT4, it is high, TSH is low, you consider it as a hyperthyroidism, you start treating and this patient will land up into a gross hyperthyroidism very, very rapidly. So it is important to distinguish between transient thyroiditis and gross hypothyroidism in management also. We will see it in management section. Now diffuse toxic goiter, what we call the Graves disease. This disorder is known as Graves disease after Robert Graves, an Irish physician who described three patients in 1835. It is an autoimmune disease with a strong familial predisposition. So whenever a Graves disease comes to you, ask for a family history particular to the mother because the female preponderance is 5 to 1. Female to male ratio is 5 to 1. The peak incidence is in the 4 to 6 decade. Graves disease is characterized by thyrotoxicosis. So all the biochemical and physiological uh, changes due to high thyroid hormones are there. Diffuse goiter, extra thyroidal conditions including ophthalmopathy, dermopathy that is pretibial myxedema. This is a misnomer. It is a pre-tibial myxedema, but it happens in Graves disease. This myxedema means a edema, which is not because of any colloidal osmotic pressure or hydrostatic pressure problem, but it is because of the growth in subcutaneous tissue. Myxedema term doesn't mean hypothyroid. So pre-tibial myxedema happens in Graves disease, thyroid acropachy, gynecomastia, and other manifestation. So ophthalmopathy, dermopathy, Thyroid acropachy, gynecomastia and other manifestation means the patient is having Graves disease. If we see the etiology, pathogenesis and pathology, the exact etiology of the initiations of the autoimmune process in Graves disease is not known. It is idiopathic. Postpartum state, what happens during pregnancy, there is suppression of immune system of a mother so that the child is not rejected. After the delivery, there is sudden uh, bounce, bouncing back of the immune system and this can cause postpartum uh, immune uh, system related problem and the patient can land up into Graves disease. The postpartum state, iodine excess, as I told you, the iodine diarrhea, the lithium therapy, the bacteria and viral infections have been suggested as a possible triggers, but we still don't know what starts the process of the Graves disease. 
genetic uh, factors, there is a close association between HLA-B8, HLA-DR3, HLA-DQA1 and 0501 with the Graves disease. Now, the stimulated B lymphocytes produce the antibodies directed against the thyroid hormone receptors. The thyroid stimulating antibodies that stimulates the TSH receptor as well as the TSH binding inhibiting immunoglobulins or antibodies have been described. So there are the recept there are the antibodies which works and looks like the TSH. They binds with the TSH receptors and they do the hyper stimulation of the gland. And this hyper stimulation will not now inhibit the TSH regulation of the thyroid gland because the receptors are occupied by these autoantibodies. The thyroid stimulating antibodies stimulate the thyrocytes to grow and synthesize the excess thyroid hormone, which is hallmark of the Graves disease. So whenever this process is because of the anti autoantibody, which is directed to the TSH receptors, then it is called a Graves disease. If there is a single nodule producing the more hormones, it is not a Graves disease. If there are multiple nodules uh, producing the hormones, it is not a Graves disease. Whenever there is an autoantibody directed to the TSH receptors, which is causing the stimulation of the thyroid gland, then and then it is called a Graves disease. Though it is mostly uh, associated with ophthalmopathy or uh, the myxedema, but it is not necessary. We will see it later on. Graves can happen without these signs also. Graves disease also associated with other autoimmune disease. So whenever the Graves is there, always look for type 1, vice versa. If the patient is having type 1, look for the Graves. Addison's disease, pernicious anemia, myasthenia gravis. Whenever the patient is having vitiligo, always think that this autoimmune process are going on at multiple levels, multiple organs. And uh, you think about uh, the other conditions. So. These are the stimulating autoantibodies. These are the stimulating autoantibodies which binds to the TSH receptors that stimulates hormone synthesis that is out of control. Too much of the hormones produced and therefore the thyrotoxicosis happens. Normally the TSH stimulates T3-T4, there is a negative feedback but that is lost here and therefore the patient lands up into thyrotoxicosis. The etiology, pathogenesis and pathology. Macroscopically the thyroid gland is patient is having diffuse and smoothly enlarged with a concomitant increase in the vascularity. If you touch the gland, it is enlarged and it is diffusely enlarged. If you put your stetho over that, you will hear a typical heave, the vascular sound. That is because of the increased vascularity. Microscopically, the gland is hyperplastic and epithelium is columnar with minimal colloid present. The nuclei exhibit mitosis and papillary projections of hyperplastic epithelium are common. Clinical manifestation, we divide into uh, related to the hyperthyroidism and those specific to the Graves disease. Whenever the, the thyroid hormones is produced in excess by nodule, single nodule or multiple nodules, this is we call it the hyperthyroidism. Heat intolerance will, there, will be there, there will be increased sweating, there will be increased thirst, there will be weight loss despite of adequate calorie intake. The patient will tell you that I am having a good appetite, I am eating too much but still I am getting weight loss. Think of two conditions, thyroid and diabetes. There will be heat intolerance. The patient will have too much of sweating and too much of thirst. Symptoms of increased adrenergic stimulation. The patient will have palpitation, nervousness, fatigue, emotional liability, hyperkinesis and tremors. This is all because of the increased adrenergic stimulation. The palpitation, nervousness, fatigue, emotional liability, hyperkinesis and tremors. The most common GI symptoms include increased frequency of the bowel movements and diarrhea. This is very important. So many times the patient will have only increased frequency, not the liquid stools. So always ask this. Female patients often develop amenuria, decreased fertility. So one of the common cause of infertility or decreased fertility is Graves or hyperthyroidism, just like myxedema or hypothyroidism. Increased incidence of miscarriages. Whenever patient gives you history of too much of abortions in the past, Think of the hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. Children experience rapid growth with early born maturation. Older patients may present to you with cardiovascular complications such as atrial fibrillation and congestive cardiac failure. Some of the older patients can present to you with repeated fractures, fragile bones because high uh, amount of thyroid hormones can cause osteoporosis and uh, bones will be fragile. Approximately 50% of patients with Graves will develop clinically evident ophthalmopathy 
and dermopathy happens in one to two percent so dermopathy is uh, uncommon and uh, around half of the patients with graves will have ophthalmopathy so this is very important all the patients of the graves will not develop ophthalmopathy only 50 percent will develop ophthalmopathy the eye signs is the lid lag what is called the graphis sign spasm of the upper eyelid revealing the sclera above the uh, corneal scleral limbus what is called the dermal sign and a prominent stare due to the catecholamine access. The true infiltrative eye disease results in periorbital edema, conjunctival swelling, congestion, what we call chemosis, proptosis and limitation of upward and lateral gaze because of the involvement of the inferior and medial rectus muscle respectively. Keratitis and even blindness due to optic nerve involvement. Now this is not at all related to T3 or T4 level. Even if you get your free T4 or TSH level within control by medical therapy, the eye signs or the ophthalmopathy will not resolve. We will see it why in the, uh, 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 the slides, uh, uh, in the next slides. But the patient will have these features. This will be pre orbital edema, conjectival swelling, congestion, proptosis, and limitation of upward and lateral gaze because of the involvement of inferior and medial rectus muscle. The rare bony involvement leads to subperiosteal bone formation and swelling in the metacarpus, what we call the thyroid acrobachy. I will show you the typical x-ray of thyroid acrobachy in the subsequent slide. But there will be subperiosteal bone formation. Just like there is a subperiosteal bone erosion in the rheumatoid arthritis, here, are, here there will be subperiosteal bone formation and swelling at the metacarpals called the thyroid acrobachy. Onychosis or separation of fingernails from the beds is a more commonly observed finding. The nails get separated from the nail beds and this is called onycholysis. So the T cells becomes hyperactive, the T helper cell, they stimulate the P cell to produce the autoantibody that binds with the TSH receptors and that stimulates the thyroid gland. Now it becomes totally autonomous. There is no regulation by the pituitary or hypothalamus. And there is too much production of the T3 and T4. The negative feedback mechanism is lost. TSH is suppressed, but that will not affect the thyroid gland. And this is how the clinical presentation of the hyperthyroidism happens. Now the ophthalmopathy is because of these antibodies. These antibodies, they increase the glycosaminoglycans in the eye muscle. And there are also some eye muscle antibodies. We don't know it's the uh, proper role, but both of these, the glycosaminoglycans and the eye muscle antibodies leads to swelling in the muscles and connective tissue behind the eyes. And therefore, even if you regulate the T3, T4 level, the pre T4, the TSH level, your ophthalmopathy will not resolve because it is because of the antibodies. And therefore, whenever the patient is having malignant ophthalmopathy, Whenever the patient has a danger of losing the eyesight, we may have to reuse the, use the immunosuppressants or steroid to take the control of the ophthalmopathy. Clinical signs, the weight loss and facial flushing is always evident. Patient will always complain to you that I am having severe weight loss. The skin is warm and moist. If you do the handshake, his hand will be moist. And this is not only African American, but Indian patients will also tell you there is a darkening of the skin. Always ask particularly to the ladies patient, whether you are having darkness of the skin or not. Tachycardia or arterial fibrillation is present with cutaneous vaso vasodilation leading to the widening of the pulse pressure, what we call the water, water hammer pulse. Uh, you must have uh, listened or you must have observed in the CVS examination, we do the pulse, pulse pressure like this, the hand raised above the shoulder. You get the water hammer pulse, tap, 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 tapping like pulse. This is because of the wide pulse pressure. The BP is uh, 120, 40, 120, 30. And this is because of the peripheral vasodilatation. This is also called the collapsing pulse. You can see it in thyrotoxicosis or Graves' disease. Fine tremor. Just tell the patient to stretch the uh, hands and keep the fingers uh, away. You will get the tremors. Muscle wasting, mainly the proximal muscle weakness. If a person is coming to you from a village, he will, he, she will complain that she is not able to uh, lift the utensils from the shelf above, uh, which is having uh, on the on the upper side. Or if the patient is uh, sitting on the floor, the patient cannot uh, uh, get up from the squatting position because of the proximal muscle weakness in the lower limb. Hyperactive tendon reflex. We saw the hypoactive or uh, delayed relaxation of the tendon reflex in the hypothyroidism. 
The hyperactive tendon reflex is the feature of the hyperthyroidism. The thyroid usually is diffuse, symmetrically enlarged, evidenced by the enlarged pyramidal lobe. Overlying brood, as I told you, if you put a statho here, you will hear the brood. So overlying brood or thrill and loud venous hum in the supraclavicular space. If you put a statho in the supraclavicular space, you can hear the venous hum. This all is because of the increased vascularity of the thyroid gland in Graves disease. A typical Graves patient having all this preorbital edema, the lead lag, and this angry looking uh, uh, appearance. You can see the injection here, this uh, uh, scleral and conjunctival involvement in the Graves disease. This is the myxedema. This is because of the deposition of the uh, subcutaneous uh, part is deposited with uh, the substances, and this leads to edema. And uh, this is the mixed edema of the Graves disease. This is the acropechy. As I told you, this is mainly involvement of the index and the thumb fingers. You can see the subperiosteal bone formation, which causes this. And you can see here the separation of nails from the nail beds, what we call the onycholysis. The diagnostic test, the suppressed TSH. TSH will be always low because the T3 and T4 are produced uh, in high amount. With or without elevated free T4 or T3 level. If iron signs are present, there is no need to do any other test. And remember, most of the time the graves will have bilateral ophthalmo, uh, ophthalmic signs or bilateral uh, ptosis, but unilateral ptosis can also happen in graves disease. So, whenever the patient is having unilateral ptosis, don't think of any retro orbital uh, tumor or other uh, conditions. First, Think of the graves and get the patient's thyroid function test done. In the absence of eye finding, you can do a 123 iodine uptake scan and there will, there will be a diffuse uptake of iodine, radioactive iodine inside. So radioactive iodine is used as a diagnostic purpose as well as therapeutic purpose. In the diagnostic, it is iodine 123. In the therapeutic, it is iodine 131. So if you do the radio iodine scan, there will be diffuse uptake. Elevated diffusely enlarged gland confirms the diagnosis of the Graves disease. It helps to differentiate from other causes of hypothyroidism. Suppose you are uh, not having ophthalmopathy, the patient is not having a uh, Graves disease proptosis, then you can do the iodine scan. If it is diffusely intake is there, then it is Graves. If there are patchy one nodule, two nodule, then this can be a solitary nodule or multinodular goiter causing the Graves disease. Antithyroid globulin and anti-TPO antibodies are elevated in around 75% of the patients. So whenever you are in doubt, you can go for the antibody testing. If the anti-TPO antithyroid globulins are raised or if the TSH receptor thyroid stimulating antibodies are raised, which is in more, more than 90% of the patients, the diagnosis of Graves is confirmed. This we are talking when the ophthalmic signs are not present. The management, the Graves disease may be treated by three treatment modalities. The antithyroid drugs, the thyroid ablation with radioactive iodine, that is iodine 131. The scan was with iodine 123, but the treatment is iodine 131 and the surgical removal, that is the thyroidectomy. Now, let's talk about the antithyroid drugs. The antithyroid medications generally are administered in the preparation for radioiodic ablation or surgery. So, it is a temporary. In 30 or 20 patients, 30, 20, 30 percent of the patients, mainly with the solitary nodule or multi, uh, multinodule goiter, you can get a remission of hyperthyroidism after uh, two or three months, two years therapy, or uh, in few patients also after 20, 20 to 24 months of therapy. But uh, in most of the patients, you cannot stop the antithyroid drugs. So in these patients, you have to go for either radioactive therapy or surgery. That is the last resort. In Graves disease also, you cannot achieve the euthyroid status in most of the patients and even if you achieve you are you will not be able to maintain the euthyroid if you stop or reduce the dosage therefore the radioactive iodine or surgery are the last resource the drugs commonly used are propyl thiouracil that is ptu 100 to 300 mg three times daily methimazole 10 to 30 mg three times daily and then you can give it once daily or carbimazole that is 10 to 30 mg carbimazole it gets converted into a methimazole. So, so these two drugs are totally equal. The mechanism of action is equal and adverse effects are also equal. We will discuss it later on. Both drugs reduces the thyroid hormone production by inhibiting the organic binding of iodine and coupling by to the iodotyrosins. So they reduce the formations of the uh, monoiodotyrosine, di, 
tri, tetra, as well as uh, mono plus di, tetra, di plus di, uh, sorry, mono plus di, tri, and di plus di, tetra. This is also retarded by these drugs. And this is mediated by thyroid peroxidase uh, enzyme. PTU also inhibits the uh, peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. This is the advantage of PTU over methimazone and carbimazone. The methy and carby only acts at the thyroid level, while the PTU also acts at the periphery level. As we know that 80% of the T3 comes from the T4 and PTU inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3. Therefore, this is a good drug in uh, what we call the thyroid storm, whenever the patient is in hyperthyroid crisis. So, PTU is a good drug and it is a lower risk of trans placental transfer as well as it doesn't get secreted into the lactation. Therefore, PTU is a drug of choice in pregnancy as well as lactation and PTU is a drug of choice in thyroid stone because it inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3. Side effects of treatment include reversible granulocytopenia. So whenever the patient is on PTU or methimazole or carbimazole, always uh, see the TC and DC, total and differential count. Skin rashes are common. Fever, whenever this can be a drug-induced fever, look at the eosinophils. The peripheral neuritis, the polyarthritis, vasculitis. I have seen uh, two patients who are CNK, PNK positive vasculitis because of uh, the carbimazole and methimazole. These patients can land up into a big trouble. So you cannot give these two molecules to these patients. And sometimes these patients remain uh, uh, problematic even after switching to the PTU. So dealing with vasculitis because of the antithyroid uh, drugs is a big problem. And rarely a granulocytosis and aplastic anemia. Therefore, it is very important to see the CBC complete blood count whenever the patient is on antithyroid treatments. The catecholamine response of thyrotoxicosis can be elevated by adrenergic beta blocking agents, mainly the propranolol, which is used in the dose of 20 to 40 milligram four times daily. So whatever the tachycardia is there, tremor is there, all the cardiac side effects, this can be nullified by giving propranol to the patients. So again, uh, let's see the classification of antithyroid drugs. The inhibitor of thyroid hormone synthesis, that is carbimethol, methimazole, and propyl thioacyl. The inhibitors of hormone release, that is iodine, iodides of sodium and potassium, and organic iodides. Radioactive iodine we will see later on. And ionic inhibitors like thiocyanate, perchlorates, and nitrates. So methimazole and carbimazole, these two are the major drugs. As I told you, the carbimazole converted into methimazole. I am touching these slides to go into the more detail of these drugs. This inhibits the thyroid peroxidase. The, what we call the TPO, which is required in intrathyroid oxidation of the iodine. By inhibiting the iodine, there will be no MIT, there will be no DIT, and there will be no tri and tetraiodothyronine. Propyl thioracyl also inhibits the peripheral conversion of T4, T3. That's why this is by inhibition of the D1 enzyme. So therefore, it is more important in thyroid stone. The carbimazole is more potent, given is a single daily dose. Both methimazole and carbimazole are better given once daily dose, empty stomach. Completely absorbed, readily accumulated in thyroid gland, excreted in urine but slower than the PTU. Some immunosuppressive action leading to decrease in serum TSH receptor antibodies. This is uh, carbimazole and methimazole's age over PTU. They can reduce the uh, TSH receptor anti antibodies. Therefore, they can give some benefit to the ophthalmopathy, to the proptosis, to the ophthalmic science of the graves. This will not be by the PTU. So in Graves, the carbimazole and methimazole are preferred whenever the patient has a ophthalmo ophthalmic changes. It has little effect on the conversion of T4 to T3. It crosses the placenta, excreted in breast milk. Therefore, both the carbi and methimazole are not preferred in uh, pregnancy and they are not preferred in thyroid stone. Adverse effect most common is macular papular rash. As I told you, there can be vasculitis, lupus-like reaction, lymphadenopathy, and acute arthralgia. Whenever a patient comes to you with severe joint pain because of methimazole or carbimazole, think of drug-induced arthralgia. Propyl thioracyl is 10 times of the um, carbimazole, given every 6 to 8 hours, rapidly absorbed, biolity of 50 to 80 percent, excreted in urine 24 hours, has no immunosuppressive effect. So this will not give any changes to the eye problems. It inhibits the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. It crosses placenta less readily, so it is preferable in pregnancy. 
not excreted in breast milk therefore it is preferred in lactation also inhibitor of the hormone disease iodine iodides of sodium and potassium organic iodides this all poses uh, the what we call the uh, constipation of the thyroid gland uh, one of the most important is glucose iodine this is given to uh, reduce the vascularity of the gland and to decrease the size and function of the gland to prepare itself for the surgery whenever the surgeon is uh, preparing for thyroid gland surgery for hyperthyroidism the glucose iodine is given to reduce the vascularity size of the thyroid gland and uh, to reduce the uh, hormone synthesis from the thyroid gland therapeutic use is uh, mainly given in the thyroid storm severe thy thyrotoxicosis to prepare the patient for the surgical re uh, uh, surgical resection of the thyroid gland adverse effect uh, there will be rash similar to that of bromism swollen salivary gland mucous membrane ulceration there will be too much of the mouth ulcers conjunctivitis rhinorrhea drug fever metallic taste bleeding disorders and rarely anaphylactoid reactions can happen because of the glucose iodine this should be kept in mind whenever a surgeon is giving glucose iodine to prepare the patient for a surgery now radioactive iodine it is the mainstay of the graves treatment across the globe the major avoid of this treatment are the, the avoidance of the surgical procedure the iodine 131 dose is calculated after the scan done by the iodine 123 and usually it is 8 to 12 microcurie administered orally the cost in india is around 6 to 10000 of this dose after standard treatment with the radioactive iodine most patients will become huge thyroid within two months so around 50 percent not most but half of the patient will become huge thyroid half will remain either hyperthyroid and will require second dose or they will it will totally burn the thyroid gland and the patient will land up into the hypothyroid then why to give radio iodine because managing hypothyroidism is easier than managing hypothyroidism you will need so many dosage adjustments so many investigations the patient will end up into cardiac problems osteoporosis so many problems with the hypothyroidism managing hypothyroid is always easy so it is better to have a hypothyroid patient because of the radio iodine therapy than a hyperthyroid or graves patient Radioiodine therapy is therefore most often used in older patients with small or moderate size goiters, those who have relapsed after medical or surgical therapy. If the patient is old, small, moderate size goiter, he has relapsed after the medical therapy, is a good candidate of radioiodine therapy. Contraindications, woman who wants to conceive or woman who has conceived, who has small children, who is lactating, radioiodine is out of question. Relative. Uh, relative contraindications are young patients, especially children and adolescents, those with thyroid nodule and those with ophthalmopathy. Ophthalmopathy is a contraindication, relative contraindication of radioiodine therapy. And inhibitors, I will not go into the de de details. These are the including monovalent like perchlorate, perchinate or thiocyanate. They block uptake of iodine by competitive inhibition and therefore the thyroid hormone synthesis is uh, inhibited. Surgical treatment. Surgery is recommended when radioiodine is contraindicated. If you have confirmed cancer or suspicious thyroid nodule, you want a biopsy, then surgery is best. Young patient who is uh, seeking, uh, who is planning pregnancy, pregnant or desire to be pregnant, severe reaction to antithyroid medications, a patient who had a vasculitis because of the methimazole or carbimazole, large goiters causing the pressure problems, hoarseness of voice, Difficulty in swallowing surgery is the only option or reluctant to undergo radioiodine thyroidine therapy. If the patient says I am not willing for radioiodine then the second option is always surgery. Near total thyroidectomy, subtotal thyroidectomy, total thyroidectomy, heart redone heal procedure. These are all the subjects of the uh, surgeon so we will not touch in, uh, or we will not go into the details. Toxic multinodular gotiola means there are multiple nodules in the thyroid gland which are producing the hormones in large quantity. This is not a grave disease, but there are multiple nodules. And suppose these patients are not hyperthyroid, but they are having multiple nodules. And if you give some contrast media for, suppose angiography or IV uh, intravenous uh, pyelography or anti-arrhythmic agent like amiodarone, which is containing good amount of iodine, this patient will land up into hyperthyroidism, what we call the jod based phenomena. We saw previously this is the thyroid diarrhea because of the iodine. Symptoms and signs of hyperthyroidism are there. 
but the grave disease is not there. There are no ophthalmic signs. There are no other uh, manifestations present because of the AT antibodies. Blood stays are similar. TSH will be low. FT4 will be high. If you do the radio adding uptake, if you do the iodine scan, you will see the hot spots like nodules, but there will be no diffuse uptake like in graves. Treatment after adequately control the hyperthyroid state, you can go for radio iodine or uh, subtotal or total thyroidectomy. Toxic adenoma or plumous disease. Only one adenoma is producing, it is hyperfunctioning or autonomous producing. It should have a size of at least 3 cm before the hypothyroidism occurs. Physical examination may reveal a single nodule. If you do the scan, there will be a hot nodule, a single hot nodule in the thyroid gland. Preferred treatment is lobectomy or isthmectomy to treat the young patient and those with larger nodules. Surgery is always better option. Thyroid storm. Thyroid storm is a condition of hyperthyroidism in an emergency room. The patient lands up in agitation, depression, severe tachycardia, uh, congestive cardiac failure. Beta blockers are always preferred drug. IV small or short acting beta blocker is always a preferred. Oxygen supplementation, non aspirin compound can be used to treat pyrexia, mainly the IV paracetamol. Lugol's iodine or IV iodine, if available, should be administered to decrease the iodine uptake and thyroid hormone secretion. This will produce what we call the thyroid constipation by the iodine. PTU therapy should be initiated because it will retard the T4 to T3 conversion. And corticosteroids are the mainstay of treatment. The patient should be immediately given hydrocortisone on admission. So this is overactive thyroid gland, overactive surgeons, and we medical person have only have to treat the patients for some time and then leave it to these over enthusiastic surgeons. Thank you for your patient listening. Hope you will handle our hyperness with the care. Yours loving the thyroid gland. Thank you very much for this uh, patient uh, listening for this long talk. Thank you. If there are any questions, please uh, you can post it uh, in the comment section below.